Well, isn't it awesome to be together and to be singing about Jesus together and to be reminding ourselves together of who Jesus is and everything that Jesus has done in our lives. I am so grateful to our worship team. I know they're probably like in the hallway making their way to the back. They won't even hear me say this, but I'm so grateful to them for constantly figuring out new music for us. And it's not because the new songs are better than the old ones. It's because it stretches our spiritual imagination and it helps us to think about God in, in from aspects and facets that we hadn't considered before. And I'm so, so grateful for what that does to stretch us as a community. There's just something about the music though, you know? And I know that you, you know what that's like. It seems like, I mean, here in Dallas, Fort Worth, I mean, there is no shortage of concerts and music venues for people to go and check out. In fact, I bet you've noticed the same pattern that I have. It seems like every couple of weeks, there'll be some big artist or, or a famous band that comes to town and everybody I know posts pictures on social media of having been to the concert, like people gathered from all over the place, you know, and, and it's people that have all sorts of different musical tastes and all sorts of different interests and all sorts of different backgrounds and people bought tickets way ahead of time and they fought traffic and they dealt with parking and they paid for, you know, all of the different fees and stuff that happened along the way. And, and everybody came together to fill up this big stadium or this concert hall and for a couple of hours, it's like time stands still for that group of people. And the music that they should, the, the, the shared experience of this music pulls them all together into something that's bigger than just the sum of its parts. And you know, in a way, our experience here is, is sort of similar. I mean, it's not exactly the same. The ticket prices are a lot better to come to Heritage, you know, and the parking's a lot easier to manage. But when we gather together at the beginning of the week and we sing these songs and we pray together and we hear the words of the scriptures, we turn our hearts and our thoughts toward God together, something happens in this moment. Something happens among us. Something happens around us. Something happens between between us that pulls us all together, even though we all come from so many different places and different backgrounds and different experiences. And I tell you what, I'm reminded of that diversity every time we gather here, every Sunday morning. I'm reminded that every Sunday we are arriving here with our own set of circumstances going on, right? Like we're all showing up and we've got our own situations that are happening out there and each one of us arrives here in a unique state of mind. And we come to this gathering like in a different, you know, mentality than even the people sitting right next to us because every single one of us is navigating our own life's journey. Every one of us is navigating a unique spiritual road and, and we're navigating our professional life and our personal life and our emotional life and our relational life. But this spiritual journey that we're on, it's just different for every single one of us. And so when you get here on Sunday morning or you tune in online, based on how your journey's going this week, you might feel more inspired or less inspired than some of the people sitting beside you. You might show up here and some of us might have a spring in our step. Some of us might have a chip on our shoulder about coming to church. But before you start feeling apologetic or embarrassed or even the least bit ashamed about that, I wanna be the first one to tell you that is absolutely normal. It is so normal for us to show up to this gathering and to come with our own needs and our own expectations and our own struggles and our own, you know, just like our own stuff. But one of the things that we all have in common in the midst of all of that is that next week we might show up and feel completely different because life can change in a hurry, right? I mean, our circumstances can change pretty quick and next week you might show up here and have a completely different sense of how your spiritual journey is going. And when it comes to the spiritual life, sometimes our outlook can change from one day or even one moment to the next. And that dynamic, that fluidity, that has been a common part of the Christian experience 
from the very beginning. I don't expect you to recognize this name, but there was a 16th century Spanish theologian who we, we call Ignatius of Loyola, and he talked about the ups and downs, the highs and lows that every Christian experiences in their journey with God. He used some uh, unusual names for them. He called the highs or the up moments, he called those the consolations, and the down or low moments, he called the desolations. And the, the consolations, those are the moments you always want to remember, right? The consolations in your life, those are, those are the little graces that make life seem more beautiful and actually like draw you toward God. It makes you think, boy, I hope there's a God because I got to give honor and thanks to something for that. You know, like the consolations are those moments when you feel wonder and amazement. It's when you feel cared for and loved. The consolations show up in the moments that make your soul smile. Like right? those are the moments that you try to commit to memory because you don't ever want to forget that. The desolations, on the other hand, those are just the opposite. Those are the moments that you would just as soon forget if you were able, and they're always accompanied by disappointment and disillusionment. Like the desolations show up, those are the moments when you feel so disconnected. It's the moment when you feel isolated and stranded. It's the moment when it feels like God is at a distance. It's the moment when you feel disconnected and out of touch from the people that care for you and the people in your community. And the thing about desolations is most of the time they show up without us choosing them or inviting them. Like we don't want these moments to happen in our life. Now we know they're coming. We know that there's gonna be some days that are better than others. We know that if there's gonna be days that feel like highs, there's gonna also be days that feel like lows. And so we're not real surprised that there are consolations and desolations that come our way. But sometimes, sometimes when we find ourselves down in that low spot, sometimes when it feels like we're in the spiritual valley, sometimes in that kind of moment, it can be difficult to remember and believe that there's a brighter day coming, right? Sometimes when you're in the darkness, you can't quite trust on your own that there's going to be a light at the end of that tunnel, which is why. That's why it's so important that none of us attempt traveling this spiritual journey alone. Let me say it again. It is so important that none of us try to travel the spiritual journey alone. And so for the last three weeks here at Heritage, we've been talking about what it means to live our spiritual lives in community. Our series is called Together. And we've been learning for the last few weeks about the connection that exists between our horizontal relationships, that is the relationships we have with other people, the connection that exists between those relationships and our vertical relationship, the relationship that we have with our creator. We've talked about how a healthy, vibrant, vertical relationship impacts the way we treat other people, right? I mean, what we've said is if God is actually working inside of us, is if God is actually having access to our hearts, changing who we are, transforming us from the inside out, then that's going to demonstrate itself in us becoming people who are loving and patient and peaceful along the way. If God's doing something inside, it's going to overflow and show on the outside as part of what we've said. But we've also said that those horizontal relationships that we're in, they can create an environment where that connection to God can grow stronger. Here's how that works. You see, when you are connected to other people who are also on a spiritual journey, walking with Jesus, as you spend time in relationships with people who have decided to be disciples, you get to watch transformation happen right before your eyes. You get to watch as people go through the process of becoming more patient, you get to watch as people start to develop kindness and generosity and hope that they didn't have before. You get to actually see metamorphosis happening in real time, and you get to see what God is up to, what God is doing around us and among us. And when you watch that happen, it builds your faith. 
When you watch other people who are submitting themselves to God's plan for their life and you're seeing them grow, it builds your faith in God. So that's what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, these vertical and horizontal relationships. But today we're turning a corner. Today in our series, we turn a corner and we, become, we start talking about some of the specific actions that we can take as a family to help each other grow. What I'm telling you is we're moving from talking about the why of togetherness and the why of community to talking about the what and the how. We're going to start talking about more specific behaviors that help us transform into who God has called us to be. So for the remainder of this series, we're going to address some of the practices that will strengthen each one of us for the spiritual journey and help us keep from giving up. We're talking about helping one another stay the course and helping, letting other people help us stay the course as well. So throughout Christian history, wisdom and experience of other Christians has told us your faith needs companionship. Your spiritual life needs companions who will help you find your way and help you stay out of trouble. They are people who can help keep you moving forward and can also save you from yourself. This is why if you were to ask anybody who's been walking with God for any significant length of time, anybody who's been a disciple for a while, they will tell you about some specific people, some individuals, some couples, or some groups who played a crucial role in their spiritual life at a critical time. If you ask a seasoned disciple, tell me about your spiritual experience and your life and your spiritual biography, they will tell you about a coworker who prayed for them. They'll tell you about a college roommate who invited them to their first Bible study. They'll tell you about a teacher who handed them a book that completely changed their way of thinking. They might tell you about a mentor who took them under their wing. It might be that they tell you about a relationship that helped them discover faith for the the very first time. But they might also tell you, they might also tell you about the people who showed up when they were just about ready to give up. They might also tell you about the people who were there when they were about ready to throw in the towel. They might tell you about the people who drove hundreds of miles to be there at the funeral. They might tell you about the person who took the day off to be there at the courtroom. They might tell you about the neighbor who said what they needed to hear even when they didn't want to hear it. They might tell you about those parents and grandparents who kept praying and praying and praying for them and never gave up on praying for them even when they were walking apart from God. This experienced disciple might tell you about a brother or sister in Christ who challenged them to change. And it was that relationship that connection that caused them to reconsider or recommit to their spiritual life. If you ask a seasoned disciple of Jesus, they will tell you about somebody, a person, or a group of people who played that important role in their faith journey because I have never heard a faith story that didn't have a relational component. I've never heard a story of somebody who walked with Jesus for very long who did it by themselves. It's one of the ways that God directs our path. You see, God wants your path to lead straight to God. God wants to set up your life so that everything that happens to you, every opportunity you face, points you toward your creator. There's a passage in the book of Proverbs where the writer says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. Don't think you can figure it all out, but trust what God has to say. And then in verse six, it says, in all your ways, submit to God and God will make your path straight. I mean, a straight path sounds good right? I mean, no, none of us are looking back on our lives and thinking, boy, the path has been straight this whole way. But this Proverbs writer is saying, God will make your path straight. God wants to lay out a simple direction for your life. God wants you to have the direct access, the clearest, quickest path to get connected to your creator. The trouble is that just because you have a straight path in front of you doesn't mean you'll always follow it, right? <laughs> Anybody can admit to that. Maybe not, but let me remind you about the last time you went bowling. You remember what bowling's like, right? I mean, it could not be a simpler concept, 
roll the ball across the floor and knock over the pins. And as a bonus, just to make things easier, there are no obstacles between you and the pins. There's no curves you have to navigate. Can you imagine if you went bowling and there was a curve, you know? There's no hills. It's not like a putt-putt course, you know? There's no, there's no hurdles. There's nothing in between you and the pins. In fact, the lane is perfectly flat perfectly level and perfectly straight. It could not be a simpler concept, but if you bowl anything like I do, and I bet some of you do, if you bowl anything like I do, the fact that that lane is level and straight doesn't actually keep you from rolling the ball in the gutter at least a few times every game, right? Because just because a path is laid out in front of us and it's straight doesn't mean we're gonna follow it. We have a propensity, we have an ability, in fact, we have an inclination to veer to the right or to the left and try as I might, every time I go bowling, at least a few times I'll struggle to get that ball to follow the right path. But I think God knows that's how it goes with our spiritual journey. I think God knows us well enough to anticipate that. In fact, God knows that we have a tough time following the straight paths that God lays out for us, that we have this tendency to swerve to the edge of the road from time to time. But God, in his amazing grace and patience, God doesn't leave us to fend for ourselves in our weakness. God doesn't look at us with any disdain or disappointment and say, I laid out the path straight for you. All you have to do is walk it, dummy. This is not who our God is. God doesn't see us that way, God doesn't speak to us that way, and God doesn't think of us that way. God never does that. In fact, when God sees us in our struggle, God rises to the occasion to help even more. It was God who saw us in our helplessness when we were entangled with sin, and so God said, I'm going down there to help out and sent Jesus. Here comes God in the flesh, a spirit turned into a body, God in a body, incarnated to be our helper. And then when Jesus was killed, resurrected, and ascended into heaven, God knew that we wouldn't know what to do next. And so God sent the Holy Spirit to be a guide for us for the next steps. And God knew that even then we might still get discouraged and lonely while we wait for Christ to come back. And so God gave us a community of people to help us stay the course. And that's what this community is about. It's about helping one another keep moving forward. It's about ch challenging one another, watching with each other, uh, keeping an eye on each other to keep us moving down that straight path. And there's an author in the New Testament portion of your Bible, some author that wrote the book of Hebrews. I tell you, we don't know who wrote this book. We don't know whether it was a man or a woman. We don't know. It's one of the few that fits that description. But this writer of this book of Hebrews understood that endurance in the faith depends on the supportive relationships that help keep us walking with God. If you're going to continue this journey for the long haul, if you're going to be a lifetime disciple of Jesus, it's going to be dependent on your connecting with other people who are on that journey. Now, I told you, we don't know who wrote this book of Hebrews, but it contains some of the most powerful imagery in all of Scripture to help us understand who Jesus is and what Jesus accomplished with his death and his resurrection. Hebrews says... Jesus gave us reason to hope even when we can't see the reason with our naked eye. And so in chapter 10 of Hebrews, which is where we're going to park ourselves for the remainder of our message today, in chapter 10 of Hebrews, when this author starts to, is, is talking about hope, the author says, let's hold on unswervingly. All right, now that is a weird word I, I, that I never use in, you know, like normal conversation. Unswervingly is not, you know, something, but I tell you what, when I think of my bowling game, I know what unswervingly means, right? Because what I would like to be able to do is to be able to bowl unswervingly or to be able to bowl with an intentional swerve or something, you know, like I want the ball to go where I intended for it to go, but my inclination is to bowl the ball down there and to watch it swerve where I didn't want it to go. I wish I could bowl unswervingly 
that helps me understand what this word means, but the author of Hebrews is saying, let us hold unswervingly without being deterred, without being distracted, and without being discouraged. Let's hold on unswervingly to the hope that we profess. Now, he says this, it's a Christian author writing to a bunch of Christian people who have already decided that they have some hope. They have some hope in Jesus, which is why they call themselves Christians. But the author of Hebrews understands that having hope at one time doesn't mean you'll always have hope. Understands that hope has to continually be renewed. The author of Hebrews understands that it's possible to start off with a really good direction and see everything go the wrong way. And so this is why after nine previous chapters talking about the reason for our hope, the author of Hebrews says, let's keep that hope. Let's keep that hope all the way. Let's hold on unswervingly to this hope because he who promised, talking about God, he who made this promise to us about our future is faithful. You see, the author of Hebrews is saying, we should look at the history that we have with God and let that be the predictor of our future with God. We should look at the track record that God has established and we should let that guide our assumptions about God's plans for the future. That God is not planning to swerve from the direction he's been taking his world and his creation from the beginning. He says, let's not, he or she says, let's hold unswervingly. Because God's doing his part. God's faithful. God continues to carry us. I got to tell you, life was not easy if you were a Christian in the first century of the history of the church, the first century AD. Life was not easy when Hebrews was written for Christian people because in that day and age, Christianity was a fringe religion. It was thought of as a cult among all of the other religions of that time. And in many places, Christians were persecuted, ostracized from society, and even killed when their faith became public knowledge. And so you can imagine Imagine, I can imagine how difficult it must have been to be living under that constant threat. The constant threat of feeling like you might be isolated, ostracized, or even executed. And then you keep seeing your other brothers and sisters in the faith injured and taken away. And I'll bet at times it was tempting to just give up. It was tempting to say, no, I'm not going this direction anymore. And they were probably asking themselves in hushed tones from time to time, how long is God going to let this go on? Do you think God sees this? What's happening? This is not what we thought it was going to be. But the Hebrews writer says, don't veer off the path. Don't swerve off the direction you started to go. Don't turn around, don't give up. In fact, the Hebrews writer is saying, stay on the straight path that God has laid out for you, but it's not something you can do by yourself, which is why the Hebrew writer used these plural, I want you to notice the plurality in this verse. The Hebrew writer said, let us hold on unswervingly to the hope that we profess, not you, we let us do this together. Faith is not a solo project. It's not an individual endeavor. It's a collective journey. You know, if you and I were to go bowling this afternoon, most bowling alleys nowadays would offer you the option of putting a bumper in the gutter so that you would never swerve over into the gutter Again, you can go and some of the bowling alleys have these inflatable tubes they put in the gutters and some of them have these little rails that fold up out of the floor of the lane. But these bumpers are like a, a guardrail that keeps the ball from ever rolling over the edge of the lane. And it's a great way for kids and inexperienced bowlers to enjoy a little bit of success instead of becoming overly discouraged. Of course, you can't use the bumpers in competition. That takes away from the challenge and the sport of the game. But boy... In our spiritual life, wouldn't it be nice if we could all benefit from having some guardrails that would keep us on that straight path? Wouldn't it be nice 
if we could all enjoy having some spiritual bumpers that would keep us moving on the path that God has laid out for us. I think this is what the Hebrews writer is saying. As followers of Jesus, we have an opportunity and an invitation to be bumpers for one another. We have to help each other keep moving forward even when somebody else starts to get a little bit off course. We have to guide one another toward the destination that God has called all of us to together. And so the Hebrew writer goes on in the next verse and says, let us think about, let us consider, let's give some real attention to how we can he says, spur one another. All the, you know, Fort Worth where the West begins people know exactly what that means, right? How we're going to encourage one another, spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Now, before we move on to the next verse, think about the culture and the circumstance these people are living in, where they are a spiritual and religious minority where they're living under constant threat of persecution. And the writer of Hebrews says, in the face of all of the things there are to be afraid of, in the face of all of the things that make it look like this plan is failing, let's think about how we can double down. Let's think about together how we can be people who lead with love and do kind things for others. Let's spur one another on and think for a long time about how we can spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let's keep going down the path that Jesus called us to travel. Let's keep following Jesus even in spite of all the distractions and the discouragements and all of the disillusionment that's going on. The writer of Hebrews says, let's keep doing the Jesus thing. Let's keep being good and loving. And let's, verse 25, let's not give up meeting together. I gotta tell you, when I was growing up, this verse was used to tell people that they should not miss church, that they should be at church multiple times a week. You know, let us not give up meeting together was like a, a frequent quote. I don't think that's what the Hebrew writer's talking about at all. I think the Hebrew writer is looking at how dangerous it feels to gather in the first place for the people he's writing, that he or she is writing to. I think the Hebrew writer is thinking about how sometimes it might seem easier just to stay home. Sometimes it might seem easier to not get together because, boy, it's risky. Somebody might find out where you're going and what you're doing and where you believe, what you believe. And the Hebrew writer is thinking, yeah, I know there's some risk. There's some things that, that are at stake here, but think about what you'd miss. Think about what you'd miss if you weren't together with the other people who are going the same direction as you. Let's not give up meeting together as some people are in the habit of doing. Instead, let's encourage one another. Let's make this the reason we get together is so that we can encourage one another. And let's do that all the more, he says, as you see the day, and it is capitalized, let's, as we see the day of Christ's return approaching. He keeps saying, as things keep heading toward the end or the consummation of God's plan, let's encourage one another, show love, and do good deeds even more than we ever have. Now, I gotta tell you, this writer knows about how challenging the life of faith can be. The writer is not being naive. The writer is not glossing over the challenges of the life of faith. The writer knows about the difficulties that every Christian faces as we walk with God. This writer knows about the consolations and the desolations, those seasons of spiritual growth and proximity and the seasons of spiritual decline and distance. The writer is fully aware of all of that, but the writer also sees an opportunity here. The writer sees an opportunity for people of faith to do what people of faith can only do for each other, which is to keep one another moving toward Jesus. The writer of this passage sees that there's an opportunity for us to build faith in one another. You see, your relationships with fellow disciples, your connection with other people who are on this same spiritual pathway that you are, your connection with those people can jumpstart your faith and it can restore your confidence in God. When you make a connection with other people who are committed to following Jesus, what you'll find is that their faithfulness can inspire you to increase your faithfulness. 
that their hope in God can restore your hope in God and that they can encourage you to keep going at the moment when you're thinking about giving up. When you have relationships with people who are serious about their faith, you can watch God's power working in their life and they can watch God's power working in your life and you can make sure the other one notices it and it can build your faith together. And then sometimes when you least expect it, but when you need it the most, those disciples in your life can share with you a message God's been wanting you to hear and it can make all the difference. You know, when I look back on my own life, I see how this story has played itself out time and time again. I grew up in a church that was quite a bit smaller than this one. It was a special place, a really, you know, a great church, but it was smaller. And so that meant that I knew virtually everybody there. And I can remember watching those people, young and old, I can remember watching those people serve and share what they had with other people in our community. I can remember the ministries that our church food pantry had that we, we helped people with, had, were dealing with food insecurity in our community. And I can remember people working tirelessly to try to serve together. I can remember people watching people as they worshiped and I can remember thinking about some of the challenges I knew about in their life and seeing them worship in the midst of all of that. I can remember adults who were inviting me to be with them while they went to serve or while they they went to visit and I shadowed them and I heard stories about their faith and about the things God had carried them through. I can remember some of those adults who taught my Bible classes and I think back to all of the parents of my friends who invited us into their home and shared what they had with us and I can remember people who came over to our house and they sat around our dining room table and they talked about church and God and Jesus and faith and why all of that was important to them. I can remember friends in college who showed up at just the right time when I was feeling all alone and those people became my community and I knew God had sent them to me. I can think of friends in this church who have encouraged me in ministry and marriage and parenthood. I can think of the small groups I've been a part of here at Heritage and all the encouragement we've shared and the support we've given to one another. And when I think back to all of those relationships, all of those friendships, I realize God's been using people to build my faith my whole life. It wasn't that God and I, it's not that God and I weren't connected. It's not that God wasn't building my faith personally, privately, but it's that God was also using people to build my faith my entire life. And it wasn't because I was so charming that I just attracted a whole bunch of friends. It was because my parents and my family and my spiritual friends put me in environments throughout my life where faith was important and faith was modeled. And I think that's the way spiritual relationships work. You can't manufacture a meaningful relationship, but you can put yourself in environments where spiritual relationships are likely to grow. You can't always create deep relationships on command or on demand, but you can position yourself among faithful people and look for ways to help and look for ways to join in and look for ways to participate. And sooner or later, you find yourself watching community form and you find yourself watching your own faith grow. And my prediction is if you'll put yourself in the kind of environments where you're around other disciples, you'll start to build a list of people in your life who have changed your faith walk people who have helped you stay on the path that God has laid out for you. You know, if you were to open your Bible to that Hebrews chapter 10 where we were and just turn the page to the very next chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, you would find this inspiring list of biblical characters whose life stories have been preserved just to be an encouragement to us. People refer to Hebrews chapter 11 as the great hall of faith because this chapter just remembers generations of people whose faith stood the test of time. And there's, there's heroes and there's kings and there's ordinary people in there and each one of them is known for their great faith that served as an example for others. You could go and read that chapter and find a lot of encouragement and inspiration and motivation for your spiritual walk. But I'm here to tell you this morning, you also need some flesh and blood in your spiritual life. You also need some flesh and blood people, people who are going to walk with you, people who are going to be there 
in your consolations and your desolations, in your highs and your lows, people who are going to be a part of the journey that is unique to you and your spiritual life. You need people in your life who are going to involve themselves and care about your spiritual growth, and you need to be involved in the lives of other people for the very same reason. And so I want you to do that, and I want you to do it here. If you're a part of our church, you need to do that for your own sake and for the sake of the people sitting around you. September is a natural time in the church year when lots of opportunities to be together and get involved start getting restarted. We got Bible studies and small groups and ministry teams and student ministry programming, big kickoff event tonight, children's ministry themes, all sorts of things that happen in the month of September. And every bit of it is designed as an opportunity for you to engage in the lives and the spiritual journeys of the people that are a part of your church family. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Right after this service, you can go down the hall, down here to the left, my left, and go down to the hub and talk to somebody who will help you connect. But don't miss it. Because you were designed for connection. You were designed for fellowship. You were made for this. And the reality is that your creator who knows you best when your creator has seen you disconnected, when your creator has seen you lonely, your creator has said, I won't stand for that. And your creator has shown up. And this is our story. This is what our story all boils down to. Because at the end of the day, I mean, there's a whole lot, there's hundreds of topics you could talk about to wrap your brain around everything that's in the Bible and everything that church is about. But at the end of the day, this is about God saying, I want relationship with my created people. And when God saw that that, create, that relationship had been damaged, fractured, God said, I'm going to go down there and fix it. And this is part of what we do when we get together is we just remind each other that this is our story.